Uh, my name is Lex Roberts. Uh, my pronouns are they and them, please. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how the National Video Game Museum uses uh, open source technologies in various ways. So I'm part of the curatorial and exhibition team at the National Video Game Museum, which is the UK's cultural home for video games. Uh, I've been there since its inception as a cultural centre in Nottingham in 2015. Uh, played a big role in building the museum. I helped move it to Sheffield in 2018. And now I'm also helping us on our pathway to full museum accreditation. Uh, in 2020, I joined the Open UK's Museums Committee as someone with an interest, but no expertise in open source, but plenty of hands-on curatorial and exhibition experience. So, in many ways, open source is kind of the next step for us as a museum. Uh, we spent a lot of time early on in the organization talking about the way in which we wanted to do things and exposing the components and systems that we use, making our gallery design accessible, using off the shelf components. It was a very early and very important design choice for us. Here you can see a few of the ways in which we do that. So that is some B&Q cladding for our German Christmas market. Obviously, we weren't able to uh, open over Christmas, but we're saving it for next year now. We, we've done it. We've done all the hard work. Um, these are some button boxes that we get from CPC. They've almost become like a part of the language of the galleries. Um, you'll see the button boxes and generic arcade buttons a lot around the museum. And you know that if you go and press some something's going to happen. A lot of the time they're like resetting games. Um, you can also see in that picture the color-coded data cables. Um, and in the bottom, we've got some Lego Technics pieces that are used to control a mechanical bull. And that was a project from the Mixed Reality Lab at the University of Nottingham. It was all held together with Lego Technics and cable ties. Um, we get on very, very well with the folks over at the Mixed Reality Lab. In some cases, behind the scenes is the exhibition. This is our elaborately named axonic cascade and the information boards that allowed visitors to see the flow of cables around the building and follow like orange was power and uh, purple is the network you can see in the picture there. So these techniques help us not only tell visitors that everyone can play games, but more importantly, they begin to show them that anyone can make games. Using open source technologies is a natural progression of this idea and helps further the ambitions of our exhibition and education programs. Here are some of the tools that we use for game development in the museum. Often they're for workshops, but also to build interactives and demonstrations ourselves. Each one offers something different. Many of the tools have been used during uh, our Pixel Heads clubs, which are after school and Saturday clubs, as well as holiday camps. Um, and more recently, uh, we deliver them via live stream and downloadable PDFs for children who are currently not in school. I'm going to talk about a few of them. First up, Scratch. So obviously, Scratch is used an in introduction to programming and game making a lot. Uh, our Pixel Heads program and the former summer schools um, used Scratch a lot as like the first step introduction. It's also worth mentioning Pocket Code here. And Scratch did release an Android tablet version in December 2019, but Pocket Code has been a block-based open source mobile ID since 2010. Um, four years ago, we were part of the No One Left Behind project, which is an EU Horizon-funded initiative to use Pocket Code uh, for, as a non-leisure toolkit uh, to enhance students' academic abilities and logical reasoning, creativity, and social skills. Uh, using game development. It's important for us to realize that children in many underprivileged areas do not have access to a computer, let alone the internet, and apps like Pocket Code and Scratch allow them to use tablets and phones, and particularly older versions of Android, and that's sometimes more helpful and more inclusive than PC software. Similarly, it's also essential that we can provide activities that you can download and distribute without the need for tutorial videos that are eating away at your mobile data. My second honorable mention goes to Piskel, which is a brilliant tool. It's a sprite editor that we use a lot to introduce children to pixel art and animation. One of the highlights from our last summer, uh, 2019 now, because we won't open over the summer this year, 
um, it was I'm Here game, which was a Flappy Bird clone that we made in Game Maker. It was accompanied by some Piscal workshops. Now, after the workshop, all the sprites were automatically uploaded to a server via a simple script that made them available to, uh, to select as a playable character in the game. Now, unfortunately, Piscal doesn't yet fulfill our preference for mobile compatible applications. But despite this, in 2020, our Create a Pixel Art character activity won Best Website Activity in the Kids and Museums Awards, which recognizes family-friendly heritage sites across the UK. Uh, and Twine, Twine is one of our favorite applications. It's the one I most enjoy talking about. Um, it's an open source tool for building interactive stories and games. It's extremely accessible and fun, and you can use it for creative writing exercises, designing stories, building games. Um, I'm going to be sharing some of my highlights of Twine in the museum. This is, uh, for a long time, we had a Twine game made by an education manager called Have You Heard About Twine, which guided your players through some of the functionalities of Twine and encouraged them to go try it at home. It is now being replaced with worksheets and a copy of Twine so you can actually write your own stories in the galleries. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, the Tentacled Horror is a choose your own adventure game that was written by screenwriter James Moran and games industry tie-in Ian Livingston for publication at the Game Seed Festival magazine about 15 years ago. Uh, one of my first projects after university was reproducing it in Twine, which I did complete with a dice roller for, for your battles. Uh, during our early years, we hosted a Twine workshop exclusively for women and femme identifying folk, where one participant produced Super Mario Bros. 1 1, the first level of Mario, in Twine, complete with options to jump on Goombas' heads and eat mushrooms. In 2017, we hosted a Football Manager The Beautiful Game exhibition, where we produced Football Manager as a text adventure to demonstrate some of the complexities of Football Manager's match engine. It would end by telling you how many decisions you had made and how many seconds it took to make them, followed by how many thousands of decisions the match engine would have made in the same amount of time. We've recently just finished a project with Sheffield Libraries, which invited participants to rewrite parts of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol in Twine. Using a combination of PHP, JavaScript, and Twine, the system allowed us to merge loads of different Twine games together into one big playable experience. We're very much looking forward to playing with the system again in the future. You can still try it at the URL below, christmascarol.bmbm.org. And finally, Death Ray Manta. It might seem a bit odd. This is a game and it, uh, rather than an open source tool, but bear with me. Uh, the Death Ray Manta, according to its Steam page, is an arcade game where you shoot lasers to kill bad guys, flash lights at yourself, and move to the next screen to do it all over again. Like I said, it was made in Game Maker, um, and it was available as part of the Humble Bundle, which is a platform for selling bundles of games for charity. Uh, the Humble Game Maker Bundle. And some of the games included in that bundle were provided with the source code if your donation was above a certain threshold which gave us a bit of an idea. The Game Maker was already taught at our after school club and the Saturday club, Pixel Heads, uh, where children generally progress scratch to Game Maker, then to Pi Game and Unity. So after speaking to DRM's creator, Rob Fearon, who like many of the contributors to the bundle had not explicitly included an open source license, gasp. <laughs> uh, so we ran a special Pixel Head session where we gave participants the opportunity to use the source code and edit the game in whatever way they wanted. And it was amazing. We had new sprites. We had the levels getting adjusted to the abilities and tastes of the children. Some of our more advanced students started to adjust the source code, asking us how to change the laser beams to do different things and sweep around in different ways. And they were all building on each other's discoveries and adaptations. It was, it was a lot of fun, both for the participants and me as a session leader. Game Maker is, of course, closed source, but what a brilliant introduction to the idea of reading and understanding source code, making software work for you and the nature of open collaboration. Next, we're going to talk about game interpretation. Loads of these should be fairly self-explanatory, and this list is not comprehensive. But I thought it'd be interesting to see some of the things we're most excited about. 
the first retro pie and retro arch without them we'd be we'd be pretty stumped um they are completely invaluable interpretation tool in loads of different ways uh, i'm sure many purists would look on in horror at seeing thrust for commodore 64 emulated on a raspberry pi but many of our visitors are children and families and we're not a computing museum uh, load times and loading instructions are sometimes a bit long and complicated for some of our visitors. And remember, video games, they're for everyone. So this makes things a lot easier and more accessible. That, that's not strictly interpretation. Uh, in April 2019, we launched Platform 14, which is a large installation of 24 screens showing 14 versions of one game. All the same, all very different. It explores the idea of porting games, and we're currently showing Donkey Kong. It invites our visitors to think about what makes Donkey Kong Donkey Kong. What do you need to keep to make a game Donkey Kong? What can you take away without losing the Donkey Kongness of a game? Uh, now, this could have been achieved with a very complicated and unwieldy set of consoles and AV adapters, controller adapters, and rigging, but emulation makes it a lot more manageable and sustainable and a repeatable platform. We hope to expand on the idea with games like Pac-Man and Street Fighter 2 in the future. Unlike Platform 14, our bonus bundle just isn't, isn't just aided by RetroPie and the emulation tools available to us. It exists solely because of them. The bonus bundle is a selection of three bonus stages from games such as Sonic, Street Fighter, and Donkey Kong Country. Using RetroPie, RetroArch emulators, a Raspberry Pi, and those button boxes I mentioned earlier, we're able to show off exactly the parts of the game that we want. In this case, specifically the bonus stages that would otherwise be only accessible if you played for long enough and well enough to unlock them. It's a really exciting use of emulation and we're still right at the beginning exploring what it can offer us. Boss levels, final scenes, the ability to quote gameplay is an extremely powerful tool and the possibilities this unlocks for how visitors can experience games in our galleries are endless. So obviously the Arduino is open hardware rather than open source software, but it does, definitely deserves a spot in this list. Uh, we use Arduino in so many applications around the museum and have had some wonderful projects exhibited in the museum that also run in, in, on Arduinos. That mechanical bull for one, for one thing. The Arduinos, or more specifically, the Arduino Leonardo or Pro Micro with the 32U4 chip, which allows it to turn anything into a keyboard. Uh, the Flappy Bird clone I mentioned earlier used an Arduino as a keyboard to ensure that it's easy to start in a one-button game. The Football Manager Twine game was powered by Arduino, featuring three buttons so you can make your decision-making quick and easy. The, that that uh, Bucking Bronco was Arduino-powered. Uh, so even in the context of this talk, Arduinos are ubiquitous at the museum. I'm limiting some of my examples to Arduinos as a keyboard because that's a particular favorite topic of mine. Uh, I, run a, I run a workshop entitled Everything is a Keyboard. I've done it in several occasions, event venues across Europe. Uh, here are the wonderful controllers that were produced by participants at the Amaze Game Festival in 2017. You can see we even had SNES cartridges being used as a controller. It's not all buttons though. This GIF, if it plays, uh, shows one exhibit in our excellent Dizzy exhibition, the egg-based games created by the Oliver Twins throughout the 1980s. It features a large copy of their hand-drawn map of Dizzy 3 with NFC tags on, a specific screen, on specific screen tiles that when you scan them on an NFC reader, which was also exposed, um, it simulated keyboard presses that then triggered video clips of that particular screen being played. As I've said, everything is a keyboard. Uh, by sim simulating keyboards, instead of hand rolling the serial communication, we avoid all sorts of complicated handshaking and other considerations that the Arduino's keyboard library takes care of for us. Other tools include uh, Inkscape, which is invaluable for laser cut projects around the galleries. You can see there at the top uh, and Screenly for digital signage, which we use not only for general gallery signage, but also for displaying web-based exhibition content. 
see at the bottom is our in-play exhibition, which is all about uh, how you relate to video game characters, inviting participants to give their thoughts and feelings about characters that they particularly uh, relate to. The open source for game preservation, uh, we use Discourse a lot. Uh, the, the, sorry, the Video Game Heritage Society was launched last year as the UK's first sub spe subject specialist network for video games. We now have over 100 members from around the world. who are one of the few SSNs that encourage membership from private collectors as well as heritage organizations. We currently operate almost exclusively via Discourse. Throughout 2021, we will begin to see uh, some hosted online events for our members as well. Our website, of course, runs on WordPress. It's currently the main method that we use for giving public access to some of our exhibition information. I mentioned collection space, which is more of a coming soon. Uh, as I said, we are on the pathway to accreditation now as a museum. And part of that will involve reorganizing and cataloging our collection. We hope to win some funding that will allow us to host and use collection space. It's an open source collection management system from Lyricis. Uh, as a relatively young museum not set in our ways, it was important to us that we find an open CMS that will allow us to explore our data and give us all the flexibility we require with a non-traditional collection. For example, allowing us to add in publisher and developers and franchises and associate all those things with our objects. If you are interested in video game preservation, uh, come and join us at the VHS. So what's next? So despite our enthusiasm for open source, we haven't yet open sourced any of our own work, which is something that we're really hoping to change this year as we launch the behind the screen section of our website. That's gonna begin with the two, like 2000 word articles about the design and implementation of our Christmas Carol Twine project. This will also be accompanied by access to the repository for the project. Um, we also would like to look at Godot, Godot's Python support and the various plugins such as point and click framework Escoria make it a really interesting candidate for Pixel Heads workshops next year. Uh, so we've got a long way to go, but despite everything over the last year, the importance of our work has been recognized by the Arts Council. Our team is growing, and that gives me a little bit more space to record and release some of our projects. The time I've spent this year with Open UK and working in the museums committee, not just um, to exhibit open source, but also to work towards ways in which we can support the museum sector in using these kinds of open technologies puts us in a really good stead to keep at it in the future. I'm sorry, I think I may have rushed through things a little. I was worried about time, but that is actually that is the end of my talk. And thank you so much for listening. Um, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, you can look up the National Video Game Museum, visit our website and also look at all the brilliant work that the Open UK team are doing. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk.